well, looks like we have a lot of you logging on. Hey, well, good morning as everyone is uh, logging on to the portal. I see you're already saying hello where you're from. So we have Alaska in the house, Puyallup in the house, Snoqualmie Valley Alliance in the house. Uh, we've got Tacoma, Tacoma. Hey, Katie, Hafferty, Brian, good to see you. Liam, Bailey, Nolan, good to see you, my friend. Hey, Ron Friesen from Salem. Glad you are all starting to log in. Yeah, as you guys are saying hello to each other, I just want to say hello to you all and welcome. I am really, really excited about uh, this conversation today because I really feel it's so important. For those of you who don't know me uh, yet, uh, I'm Monty. I am uh, your district superintendent for the Alliance Northwest. And uh, the conversation that we're having today um, is with two people uh, that many of you know, some of you may not, but two people who I absolutely adore and respect. Uh, Morris Dirks and Jane Wolf have both impacted my life in so many ways over the years. And so I thought with our first uh, A&W webinar launching out, dealing with how are we actually doing? How is our emotional health, mental health, spiritual health doing? couldn't think of two, uh, two better people to, uh, to bring into the conversation. And so uh, the big question and the big topic we're, we're tackling with, with Morris and Jane, they're going to be speaking from their perspectives of spiritual direction and uh, mental health professional, uh, and they're going to interact with us. But the big question today is trying to understand how this last year of ministry has really affected us. It's affected us in ways that we know and we don't know. With COVID-19 and just looking at the crises in our culture, we have had a year of fear, of loss, of political disagreement. It's affected us mentally. It's affected us emotionally. It's affected us spiritually. And so I'm looking forward to Morris and Jane walking us through some, some really key questions uh, on, on this subject. Uh, I had a, a stat I just wanted to start with before we dig in and just wanted to also let all of the attendees know about every 15 minutes, or I, I'm going to try to pause and look at the Q&A tab. So at the bottom of your screen, maybe find that you see the little tab that says Q&A. If you have questions, um, just type them in there. Uh, if something's uh, sparking something in you or causing you to wonder or notice, and you would maybe like Morris or Jane or both to address that, just pop those questions in the Q&A box and we'll pause, we'll look through, we'll, we'll, we'll answer what we can um, as we go through today. Um, but as I talk with leaders across uh, the Alliance Northwest, and I've had opportunity to talk with many of you, until I'm hearing, I'm hearing how tired you are. Uh, I'm hearing how much loss you're experiencing. There's fear of what the future is going to look like post COVID. I'm hearing leaders who are just struggling, seeing the anger in their people that they have been leading for sometimes years that are arguing or even leaving over to wear a mask or to not wear a mask vaccines or not vaccines. I've had many questions on how do I, how do I minister to the QAnon people in, in my church? And there, this has become a season of hyper-criticism um, for pastors. Seems like you can never make the right choice. Uh, so we have no blueprint. And I see that this last year has uh, really created a vulnerability and it's really hit our emotional strength, our, our spiritual strength, and even our physical vitality. And so we want to address that. Uh, one study, and then we're going to jump in. Um, a recent study of, uh, of the U.S. population revealed that, <laughs> listen to this stat, 25% of people are experiencing high distress. 25% in high distress. 50% of Americans are in moderate distress. 25% are in low distress. Well, as I add that up, 
that's a hundred percent that a hundred percent of the people in our church is a hundred percent of the population hundred percent of our neighbors are in some level of distress and that includes pastors and part of our role is working with people in distress uh in this study, distressed is seen as the likelihood to have increased levels of anxiety and depressive symptoms. If this study is at all reflective of us as church leaders, our congregations and surrounding communities, then it might be fair to assume that roughly 75% of us are living with moderate to high degrees of distress at this time. So Morris and Jane, welcome. Uh, Welcome to the topic at hand. I'm going to throw it out to both of you right now. What are you hearing um, in your worlds of ministry with people from leaders? What are you hearing? What are you sensing from people? What are we struggling with? I'll throw it to Morris first, and then uh, then we'll go over to Jane. Okay. Thanks, Monty. I, I This morning when I came into my office, I decided I'd just collect a couple of things about this, and I'll just... I'll just hit it quickly. And then if you want to come back, we can dialogue on it. But the words that came to my mind as I do spiritual direction with about 40 uh, people, and I, I would say 30 plus are pastors, maybe 35, okay. um, is this uh, sense of, of dissonance or, or disappointment or disillusionment, all the D words that come up now in our lives. Um, and, and it all starts off with, I think, a deep feeling underneath when you're pastoring in church right now. Um, maybe the words are that we all have going on underneath is, I thought we were better than this. Uh -huh. I, I, thought, I thought we, the church, and our people. Um, and so the mask has come off. And I think three things, as we know, brought it off. The response to COVID and the disagreements and, and the, the lack of a discipled commitment around how we, how we relate to our culture when it's hurting. And how do we lead our people when they don't agree with us? You highlighted that, Monty. The, the election and political opinion has really uh, brought the mask off and, and revealed our, our, our being discipled by CNN and Fox more than Fox <laughs> scripture. And, and, and then the social justice issues and the disagreement about BLM and, and how do we engage in all of that. So anyway, I, I think then behind that, um, there's this realization that we've become program dependent and as we've come out of programs, we, we are now realizing, I don't, we don't want to go back to the way we were. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of stress around how do we decide, how do we disciple people in the new in the new world order? And what does it look like on the other side? I've sensed that some people are optimistic, especially on the front end of saying, oh, this is a chance to re-script and redo things. But uh, as we've gone on, a lot of people have lost that optimism. And there's, there's a loss of joy in their calling, a sense of betrayal by people in the body, and um, feelings of that the church is so enculturated. How do we even begin to lead it forward right now in America? So um, yeah. that's, that's been my take as I've been rotating around people month to month over the last 12 months. Wow. Jane, how about you? Um, in your uh, in your leadership and in counseling and recovery and all the work that you've been doing, um, what are you hearing? What are you sensing? And I'd even say to our attendees, if you know, tell us in the tell us in the chat, what are you what are you feeling too? We can we can see what's what's even in the room uh, today. But Jane, what what are you hearing? Well, to me, it's uh, it's interesting to look back over a year ago. And to see where we were a year ago, where people were really pretty much, okay, we can do this. Uh, uh, something's hit us. And uh, so we take out four weeks. Hey, maybe it'll be six weeks. Maybe it'll be two months. But then as the reality began to really sink in uh, of what this was, um, I remember myself, I, happened, I was in New York City on March the first week of March, and um, flew home on a plane on March 6th, and I remember texting to my sister, who lives in Manhattan, hey, there's people on this plane that have masks on. Wow. I wonder what's going on. And uh, and I, I look back at that and kind of chuckle, oh my word, have we come, up, have we come a long way. So I think it's been a year where we've 
to put it one way, we've had accumulated losses. Mm -hmm. We had a hint of it yeah. um, a year ago. And then as we've waded into this water, it's got deeper and deeper and the losses become more and more apparent. And um, so as we, as we get into this today, uh, it's true that I've got a background in therapy and in counseling, but the truth is that uh, as a spiritual director, that's really where I am at this point. I think there's much for us to look at from the mental health viewpoint, but I see this as huge losses that we need to face. And I would encourage those of you who are um, uh, with the webinar today, maybe to just have a piece of paper. And uh, as you think of something that you've lost, that is no longer a part of your life, just jot it down and make a list so that at the end you can take a look at what we've lost. That's good. Yeah, even in the even in that chat bar, maybe you know, start that conversation there. But Morris, let's if we can maybe stay with loss for a little bit. Can you talk about? Could you just tell us about and and then Jane jump in on this one too? The com the compounding loss that's happening that you're seeing that uh, that we need to be aware of. Yeah, I I, I think that we. Uh we've all lost track of like Jane has said as to how many things have layered up yeah. and, and um, depending on where you are and, and the things, you know, we can talk about COVID and the election and uh, social justice issues, but then there's been layering relationally in our own families and health issues and financial issues. And I keep meeting people who've lost loved ones, not necessarily to COVID, but that might be, but uh, a, a death right in the middle of it, a marital crisis right in the middle of it, yeah. kid crises right in the middle of it, um, a, a loss of financial security in the middle of it. I mean, sometimes I am stunned by the, the layers that have built up, the smoke incidents that came flying through in the fall, and then the ice incident for some people in the snow this winter. And yeah. There just seems to be no end to the personal loss and then the church experiences of loss. Way back about six or seven months ago, I took up my journal and realized I need to write down, as Jane said, all the things that I'm feeling anxious about. I don't know how they're going to come back. And yeah. uh, I was struggling with anxiety because when I listed, I, I think I probably had seven things on my list that I was anxious about. How is that ever coming back to center again? And yeah. um relating to children, um, relating to finances, relating, you know, I'm pushing towards retirement. It's not a great time for things to do what they did. There were a lot of personal things and then um, related to the church. My church, the church that I participated in, had, had its own issues going on that weren't even related to COVID that, that threw me sideways um, and, and, and caused me to feel a lot of dissonance with the church that I attend. And so uh, there's a lot of personal things and a lot of uh, a leadership um, career, career ministry things that are all on top of the list. Okay. How about you, Jane? What do you, what do you, what do you thinking with our layers of loss? Well, I, I, I just think the amount of layers is just, it's phenomenal. And, but to make the list, to get it down there and then to say, I think to go one step farther pa past that to say, okay, I've lost, I've lost, hey, the ability to see faces. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that I was just at the grocery store. Yeah. And I'm walking down, you know, with everybody with masks on, and I hear, hey, is that Jane Wolf? And I turn and I looked and I didn't know who it was. So he pulls down his mask and it's Steve Fowler. And I just said, oh, it is so good to see you. Yeah. I, I, my, my temptation was to run over and give him a hug. And I went, oh, it's COVID. I can't give you a hug. But right there is just right in my face, the loss and the feel. So I think on the losses, it's also important to begin to identify what we feel about that. Yeah. What, what do I feel about not seeing people? And at first I can go, oh, Jane, get over it. 
watch, watch and see what they're doing in a refugee camp. Um, uh, and you haven't got anything to complain about. So I can give myself that talk. And then the truth is, we go into denial about ourselves. Yeah. It really isn't a matter of what do they do over there, but I've got to look at me. Yeah. I have to look at me. And the, I, I, if nothing else, Monty, today, I want to say that, that all of this stuff that's going on, the, the reason I think it's important to look at me is because if I don't look at me, I'm missing a major source of mm -hmm. being of hearing from God, because I think knowing what's going on with me keeps me out of the space of being deceived by the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I can get deceived and think that I can just skim over the top. I'm just fine. And but by identifying what I've lost and how I really feel about it, and then saying, so what am I gonna do down the road? Um, I, get, I, get a, I get an opportunity. Uh, pardon me for preaching, all you preachers. But uh, <laughs> um, in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm really impressed that Jesus says that your eyes are the lamp of your body. And I go, what's that mean? Well, one of my meanings on that is take a look at what's going on. What do you see? What do I see in myself? What do I see around me? Because that's going to give me light for the path that I'm on. I really, really need it. So, Monty, I, I want to come alongside Jane there and say, I can't do the good work on me emotionally or even what I'm feeling physically um, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm experiencing certain emotions, what it's doing in my body, if I'm not talking with someone. Yeah. And, uh, now, often that's my wife, Ruth, who's a therapist, but I got to get outside my home because she doesn't want all that. And, yeah. and uh, this has been a difficult time to connect and talk with people. So yeah. I've been meeting a lot of pastors who in the early stages were shut down and saying, I, you know, I think I'll drop out of spiritual direction now. Or my wife said, some people are just leaving counseling for a while. Well, they're, they're back. And yeah. like Ruth had four requests last week for new clients and can't take them. And saying people are trying to find a place to talk now and are struggling. Yeah. I, I think what's, what's also lacking is um, I'm trying to bring pastors together with pastors so we can talk to each other. Yeah. Um, so we can resonate with, with the pain or the disillusionment, uh, the disorientation together. Yeah. Cause I think there's a, a, a well of strength that comes up when you hear that a brother or sister are really feeling the same things and can process that process. Yeah. So that's why, that's why I lean heavily into spiritual direction. Yeah. Can I, can I piggyback there on Morris to say, um, I think it is uh, to be able to, I need somebody to talk to. All of us need somebody yeah. to talk to, but somebody that we talk honestly with. Yeah. If I, if I'm in a group and I, I'm my significance or my security is connected up with how I come out looking, even yeah. if that's just under the surface, then that talk is just going to uh, put me farther back. Yeah. I need to, I need to be talking where I can be honest um, and uh, begin to explore uh, where might I be, where I don't have easy answers. This whole thing of loss and um, mental health, we need more than an understanding of what's going on. Yeah. Just an understanding so we can talk today, we can talk about, oh, I understand this, I understand that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It just gives me information, but it doesn't really form my soul. And Jane, to pick up on that, um, I think we all know this, everyone online, a lot of you, if you are in a church where you can actually talk honestly with the staff or, or elders or other leaders in your church, that's a rare place because I'm meeting a lot of pastors who, who can't talk honestly with, with their staff members about what they're really feeling, um, or certainly they can't with their elders if they work with an elder board. 
And uh, so there's just this high degree of isolation within their very own body of yes. believers. Uh, they can't seem to connect with anyone in their body of believers to talk about what they're feeling. Yeah. So Morris and Jane, I was with a bunch of our district youth pastors last week and got to talk to them a couple of times. And on one of my sessions was just looking at really, you know, you know, seven ministry life hacks. And, and that was, that was one of the, the key things is you have to find safe people. And oftentimes those safe people are not within the church walls where you serve. And, you know, that's unfortunate, uh, but it's reality. You definitely, you have to seek out that soul friend, those soul friends outside of the context who can love you well and help speak truth into you. Um, there's a, there's a, there's kind of a question that came in. If I could throw to this, it's, it's kind of a question. So, hey, Susan, I'm just looking at your comment, but I, I think this is, a, it, it kind of ties into this with loss. But uh, Susan uh, said in the chat that I think loss of what to aim for or hope for as things settle out. I don't want to return to the old church normal. I'm hearing this a lot. Yeah. I don't want to hear a return to the old church normal, but I don't know what the new can look like. So as I read, Susan, as I read that, you're talking about that you're in liminal space right now. So liminal space is that nomad's yes. land between where you were and what was known, where you're going and you're not there yet. It's like you let go of one trapeze and you're heading for the next one, but you haven't grabbed it yet. So Morris and, and Jane, thoughts from you on how do we navigate? What do we need to do in light of this loss and this liminality? How do we and what do we do to move forward uh, in, in light of that? That's a, that's a great thought. We are such Americans. <laughs> we, we, want, we want to get moved forward. Yeah. And I, I think that one of the things in dealing with loss we're really uh, the the whole thing of a grief process I, I don't think we jump from just looking at something to oops okay so we have to accept that this isn't going to be here now let's move on i think we've got to walk through that we've got to do the all the steps that everybody's familiar with i'm sure of uh am i depressed uh, am I angry? What am I angry about? I got to deal with that. Come to the acceptance. But I doubt that we're ready to know where we're going. <laughs> I think that beginning to note to myself or to the people I'm talking with of what have I been learning? What is God showing me that I don't want to go back to? And mm -hmm. what is it that I want to keep and aim for. And before I put the, okay, we're gonna do this from 2.30 to four on Thursday afternoons, we're coming down to some principles of what, what do I, at this point, what might I like to see? And yeah. what might God be saying to me? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I wanna, I just want to push something that I'm feeling so strongly about, and that is that, uh, as, as Jane alluded to the American church, uh, we go to program or ideas or shifts in structure, shifts in leadership, shifts in the way we're, we're going to do worship or something, and, 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 or relate to people in discipleship. But um, that is such a, a foggy place to look right now. And um, yeah. as it's we've gone farther and uh, yeah, as we've gone farther and farther along, I'm realizing we just really didn't need a deeper relationship with Christ. Yeah. I, I need to release the pressures of leadership and the uncertainty in a spiritual way in union with Jesus one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just feel like one of the things that's showing up is um, our, our Christology of, of a real dynamic union with Christ where we deal with our emotional challenges and walk them to him and the uncertainty of how are we going to lead the church forward after this. I need some sense of, uh, of, of spiritual and emotional balance with Christ before I can ever think about leading his church because I don't think there's a silver bullet on the backside of this. I, I think there's going to be a lot more challenges 
And I just want to say up front, I don't think our churches are willing to change uh, in the way we want to change as pastors yet. I, mm -hmm. I think our people, most of them want to come back to the way it was. And I think that's going to be a very painful thing for us to deal with. So I want to be in tight union with Jesus. Yeah. It just would add in, you know, Jesus never left Jerusalem. He kept coming back to the hardest place to work where people weren't changing. And the only way he did that is because he had such a self-differentiated way of living with the father. I do what the father tells me to do. And he found his union there to be able to cope with the disappointment of his disciples and the crowd and the Pharisees and everything else in between. Oh, I, have a, yeah. I have a question in on, on this for both of you. What, uh, what the question is, what are the main reasons you hear that pastors don't feel like they can open up and be transparent to their elder board or other close members uh, that are connected. So what are, what are the main uh, reasons that you two are hearing that, that it, it, it's not safe to open up? Oh, I'm really supposed to say that here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not well, sure this is, safe. <laughs> this is a safe place to say this. <laughs> um, really good question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think it, it comes back to that very often there's some things that uh, a person is thinking that they're not quite sure, how is this going to go over if I really share how I feel? And uh, the, the very, um, I'm going to tell you how I feel, and if you don't, uh, if you don't agree with me, hey, I'm out of here. That whole kind of mentality has just, it's seeped out of our culture into every place, into our churches. And, and I think we're very influenced by what are people going to think if I, if I really say uh, what I'm questioning. And uh, which I would, I would say that having somebody that you talk with that you know is confidential, but doesn't threaten your position at all is a good place to start mm. that I need somebody other than the people that I work with other than the people that I'm leading and after I find that safe group then I can I can I can do that but to talk where Morris was talking to be able to develop my own my own relationship with Christ to be able to spend quiet time uh, to listen. What is the spirit saying to me? Uh, what is, what do I sense God is saying to me? Who do I check this out with? Uh, I, 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 we can get so involved in what are people gonna think, which of course comes back to another huge issue, which is my desire to control outcomes. Yeah, right. <clears throat> I, uh, my personal experience was uh, I wanted to be heroic and for the first two thirds of my ministry felt like telling people where I was hurting uh, wasn't, what, wasn't the window I wanted to open up and then when I really hit the wall and was needing to tell people and finally opened it up I, I found out that uh, there were a lot of leaders that didn't want to hear what yes. I was struggling with, that my, that my struggle was a threat to them mm -hmm. as, as elders and other leaders. And my staff didn't want to hear, I was a lead pastor, so I'll speak from that perspective. My, my staff didn't want to hear my disillusionment. Um, they needed me to be strong. I, and so I bought that. And um, until I found two people in that church that... Um, that I, I could share everything with and that I could cry with. Um, and one was an elder and the other was just an attender uh, who was studying to be a therapist in the church. But, um, and then I went outside the church to uh, a counselor and a spiritual director. But uh, for me, uh, I was on a heroic journey. Not everyone gets on that, but, but, I, but I allowed myself to be shut down um, to try to, to, try to uh, present a, a, strong, a strong front and when I finally let that down, I found out that people didn't, most people didn't really want to hear about how I was hurting. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Because usually when a pastor presents how they're hurting, 
they're, they're like like we all feel like the people feel I have to present a, some solvable answer to this person who's hurting, and and them trying to present that back to to their leader is often impossible. So they so they just feel shut down when the, when they hear you starting to share that you don't feel called to the ministry anymore, that you don't feel optimistic, that you don't feel close to Christ, that your prayer life sucks. Uh, they they don't know how to handle that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, you know, if I could maybe pivot us on on that, and I just want, thanks for the question in there. That's a, a great question. And don't forget, keep popping questions in, in for us if you have some. Um, you know, as I've heard about loss, you know, I'm hearing the layers of loss. I'm hearing just even in, in people's homes, all of a sudden there's the loss of sending your kids to school, you, you know, and so now you're homeschooling. And so now you're having to shift your job. So that job rhythm has shifted. The overwhelmingness of now being a teacher and a parent and trying to work from home has led a lot of people to another layer of loss, like a job loss. They just can't do both. So now they've lost their, that community. They start to lose more identity. And so, uh, you know, as we you know, as we kind of transition out of the, the loss conversation, I, I just would like to reiterate what both of you are saying and encourage all of us this is a great time maybe even this week sit down and really think through on on maybe a, a personal level a spiritual level um and physical level what have i really been losing because you can't grieve what you're what you're not aware of and right. so we need to move towards being able to grieve these things grieving the way that you did church or the way you 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 don't know what's coming next grieving that community gr grieving that you don't have the touch and it's been a very long time um one of the other pieces i'd like to throw at you is um i'm sensing with pastors that they've hit decision fatigue and because we are having to make decisions all the time and then remake the decision and then remake the decision and i don't know how you guys are doing but with even the pivots that I've had to, sometimes I get home, I can't even decide what I want to eat. Um, it's just like, I don't want to make another decision today. So how, is, how do you see decision fatigue um, affecting us? And what are some strategies or tools that we could use just when we're, we're just kind of emotionally done because the day is full of decision? So I have to make a decision how to answer that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm sure I sound like I, I'm just a old broken record. I think some of you probably remember what records are. Um, that again, I've got to admit where I am and decide and it's uh, a piece of saying what am I going to do when I get to that decision stuff do I do I have to make a decision do I how do I feel about this getting inside looking at that and really tear, tear, taking it apart again um and um talking with people, looking at it, writing, sitting down, writing about it, uh, listening to myself, listening to others. I think that's, that's, I'm just going to come back to the same kind of thing. Um, um, yeah, I'm tired of trying to figure, I got without heat and lights, trying to figure out how to eat. Uh, hey, that was, that was one of those things that over and over, oh no, what, do we really have to eat? Um, just simple stuff like that, but yeah, Morris. Yeah. I just saw somebody post up decision fatigue, especially when it feels like no matter what the decision made, someone will let you know how bad a decision it was. It was, yeah. Man, I'm just hearing that over and over again, that, uh, it's no win. It's a no win. So I'm going to come back to what I think is the, uh, fundamental starting point to, to gaining some traction here and it's it's not winning on the one side and 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 thinking you'll win um it's winning on the inside and yep. and, and to me that's about solitude so yep. okay I, I don't think we can pray until we're centered mm -hmm. um i think if we're feeling compulsive um it's gonna the engine is gonna keep spinning 
And when we're in decision-making mode, we're often feeling compulsive, especially mm -hmm. being criticized. So there's two words that I like to ask pastors all the time. I go, when, when you're looking at your interior life, are, are you feeling compulsive or are you feeling contemplative? Now, the contemplative word, we often think that means you're off at a monastery. I don't mean that at all. I know when on the inside, I'm feeling centered and contemplative, and I'm, I'm feeling consolation, as, as Ignatius says. I also know when I'm feeling compulsive, when I'm feeling um, overwhelmed, or as, as Ignatius says, desolation. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're operating in a compulsive culture, and we're leading the church at, when we're feeling compulsion, we're going to have a lot of decision overload. And so I, the, 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 the thing is that so many of us are not willing to take time to go away and, and be alone long enough until we, we find that, that, that centered place, that contemplative place from which we, we can hear God and make good decisions. Oh, so good. Um, there's a question, uh, a question in for you uh, both. Um, Apart from, mod here's a question, apart from modeling transparency, what are some healthy ways you've seen churches create a culture of transparency and spiritual humility? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat Jane to that <laughs> because, because at, at Salem Alliance and Ron Friesen's on today and Ron and Jane and I worked together, hey, it wasn't until we, till we began to really process what is grace. And yep. then really process what is recovery, what is health, what are healthy relationships, what does recovery look like in community, which led to a recovery ministry, but also preaching, teaching, and modeling from the stage that kind of, of, of call to a grace-based culture of transparency and vulnerability with God and with others. And that, that was built over years. Um, that took a long time for us to build as leaders. And then we, Jane led us into the 12 steps. When, when a lot of people understand the 12 steps model, then they begin to understand the need for transparency and trust. And when enough people in the church have bought into that culture, you'll see some movement. Um, we also went through the 12 steps as a staff and just said, we can't tell our people to be doing this if we're not doing it. So Jane led us through the 12 step experience as a staff. And uh, that's, that's my place where I felt like we actually led a body of believers into a, a DNA that was deeper on that level. I'll, talk, I'll pass it to Jane now who can add all that in around it. Um, I think that there, uh, in order to get to transparency, there has to be something that, ha that we have to be honest with our leadership, somebody in leadership, probably the lead pastor, needs to know that where we are isn't working. Yeah. There, there's got to be, that, that's a, a, a basic deal in being, in being willing to change is that what I've got isn't enough. It's not getting me in any part of my life where I want to go, then I become willing to look at something different. And, um, and so I think that that is where it has to start. It's not a matter of, um, oh, they've got a good program. Let's try that. Let's try honesty. <laughs> Let's try transparency. Uh, because I hear that that really changes your church. I, hey, it, <laughs> Uh, that's just, hey, I, I say that, and it sounds, I'm not just being facetious. I've no. heard that. <laughs> oh, how do we get to, how do we get to here? And um, it takes a willingness <laughs> yeah. to look at myself <laughs> yeah. and to say, what is going on in here? What is going on with the people I'm leading? And a willingness to say, there's got to be some kind of change here, um, which I know I've been, I've said this in how many different ways this morning, over and over and over that, um, and for, for me, uh, getting into um, dealing with my own flaws, 
my mm. own uh, brokenness took my getting to a point of hey what i'm doing just isn't working it's yeah. it's fun it's falling apart and yet i tend i keep trying to control the outcome i keep doing this or that and i come to see it um that's that's i i know i say the same thing over and over but um i think it comes down to the same thing yeah yeah i i'm with you jane i had a uh, you know over the years with uh, we had launched recovery, you know, in our church. And, you know, we had at one point, you know, well over 120 people weekly in recovery and, and uh, pastors, I cannot almost weekly for years calling me to like, so how are you using, uh, how are you using celebrate recovery as an outreach to grow your church? And I, I'm just gonna be honest, I would sit with them and go, if you're looking at using recovery as a tool to grow your church, please, don't do recovery you should actually be in in recovery and yes. <laughs> because recovery it gets messy it you you have to you have to be infused with grace for for everyone because your church really becomes a, a messy place but a beautiful mess it's a beautiful mess but you have to be committed you have to be committed to that more than church growth and so that's a it's a rad that is a radical shift and I, so I, I think that was a a great question Monty, it's work to create that yeah more i'll throw a question at you monty um i think that when pastors and leaders start to lead in a way where they're taking churches to healthy places at times i know leaders actually feel like i feel like i'm putting my career at risk yeah. because the the people i lead may not want what i'm going to do or may not like jesus uh take the message and there'll be a crucifixion and so as we transition out of COVID into the new future, I, I'm meeting pastors who are, who are talking about where they feel like they need to go. Yeah. And, and you talk about vulnerability and risk is they feel like if, if we begin to go where we need to go as a church, I, I might be putting my job at risk. How, how should a pastor handle the fact that they have to live permanently like Jesus with the possibility of crucifixion? Sure. Hey, you're throwing the question to me. Yeah, yeah, it's at you, Monty. Hey, I'm just supposed to facilitate. You, I have no, I have no opinions on anything. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, Monty, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with talking too much. Uh, uh -huh. No, Morris, I think. Wow, what a great question. Um, in in I would also say in most cases. Pastors are at a spiritual and a theological point that is obvious is much ahead of their congregations. Oftentimes, uh, pastors feel like they're pulling a group of people along to greater and greater awareness. So part of the pastoral job is realizing how far you can push, being very sensitive to Holy Spirit on how do I move this group of people to the next to the next level. And to off, honestly, I would say it's to grieve where you're not able to go yet. For me, what I'm, I think one of, one of the biggest heartaches for me right now is seeing the split in our churches over really dumb things like to wear a mask or to not wear a mask. Because that shows you where the discipleship level of our people really are at. And so to come out and to speak... Um, and to, to speak what you, you feel where you need to go does have a risk. So the way I've approached that over the year is it's never easy, but the way I've approached it is to remind myself as I lead and as I teach and as I interact, I really serve one person. Um, I, I've never wanted to be that hireling in the church, Morris, because then they control my content. They control what I feel the spirit is doing and and, and churning in me. And I feel my role as, as shepherd has been to listen to the voice of spirit and to lead in that direction, no matter what the cost. And sometimes it just costs me. Recovery costs me. I, I'm sad to say that. I, I, pro I, lost, I, pro I lost well over 100 people the year I launched a recovery program. I also gained far more than I lost. But part of it is to just to be honest about where you're at and where you're forming Think about how do I shepherd these people by degree, 
you can't get them from where they're at to maybe where you're at, but you have to think in terms of first downs a lot. Okay, I made 10 more yards, I made 10 more yards and to keep leading that way, uh, but that can be tiring too. But if you think in terms of, I'm gonna keep moving it like this, yeah. uh, that's honoring, honoring where they're at and not blowing them out of the water. Yeah. Yet at the same time, remember not to lead codependently um which i'd love to hear you and jane speak on that you know to if we're conflict avoidant or codependent in our leadership that will kill a church um you know god's placed you to lead so so one is acknowledging that and that was one of the areas i had to grow through was in you know uh, trying to be a people pleaser trying to keep everyone happy I'm 27 in my first church planet three bleeding ulcers because of that so Anyway, that's where I would probably land on that is remember who you who you serve first and then who you lead second and, and then to, to grieve what you're unable to share yet, but then look for ways to move people towards them. Yeah. Yes. Any any words of advice from both of you on in this season with so many decisions and so many choices that leaders are making that are creating ripples and divisions? Um, if, if for those of us on the, the call today that do struggle with codependency or people pleasing, um, or conflict avoidant, how, one, how are they doing? But two, what, what words would you have for them? Because this has really got to be hurting them. It was codependency that burned me out. Mm -hmm. It was codependency that sent me to, in the end, to a psychiatrist, um, first to a counselor and then to a psychiatrist and then back to a spiritual director and a counselor um, because I, uh, I didn't even realize how codependent I was. I think that's right. I had no idea how conflict avoidant I was, how much anxiety I had been allowing to build up inside of me over fear of people leaving the church, one more family leaving, Every one of those is, is a heartache, uh, is an anxiety attack for some of us when we hear another person's leaving, especially if they're very much at the center of the life of the church or possibly an elder or another leader. Uh, I was with somebody yesterday who said that all of this has triggered uh, uh, their only other very key staff member to leave the church and saying, I do not want to engage in the, the discussions that you want to have about social justice in our church because mm -hmm. I just don't believe what you believe about social justice. I, I don't believe what you believe about Black Lives Matter. I don't believe that stuff. I don't believe we need to do work in that area the way you think we do. So I'm out. Yeah. And, and this was very significant uh, co-leader in the life of the church and a friend. And yeah. the loss was huge. And um, so I, I don't think I was aware of that. I wish that uh, I had read a lot more about codependency and had a, a good therapist helping me process my codependency and my anxiety around pleasing people way back in my 30s, which I didn't do till I was in my 50s. And uh, some good books. I know Jane's going to pick up on this. I'm going to grab a couple of books that I think have been critical for my understanding of, 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 of how to deal with codependency. So, okay. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, understanding what that that's a word that gets thrown around a lot, uh, codependency, and uh, just understanding of um, that codependency is me trying to control things that are not mine to control. Mm -hmm. uh, my stepping in um, and inevitably it comes out of my out of, out of my own self uh, i i can say people require me to do this or uh, if i don't do this this is what's going to happen but that is about me really uh, it's for sure that might be going to happen but um when i get pulled in to doing something that truly is not mine to do yeah. That is called codependency. That's what that is. And um, the, the term came from, it, came, it was a word that was coined back in the 1970s as um, some of the alcohol treatment centers actually in the southwest of the United States did um, some big research on what happens 
when an alcoholic or an addict uh, goes to treatment and gets clean and sober. Well, the idea was, uh, as treatment centers got started back there in the 60s and 70s, that if we can get somebody clean and sober, you know, if I can get the people in my church thinking straight, then we're going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, what, but what happened was that they found that as the clean, sober addict went home, a tremendous portion of families split apart. Wow. They didn't make it. And so that is what triggered the research into what is going on. And what people found, what they found out is that the family had actually become dependent on being needed by the addict. Mm -hmm. And when the addict was clean and sober and no longer needed them, they didn't have their place anymore. They didn't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. And then the conflict just went out of hand and the family split up. And that's where the term came from, codependency. <laughs> Actually, as my understanding is, that word was first used uh, on the old, very old Phil Donahue show. No, as no. the author Claudia Black said, they're what we're going to call codependence. Uh -huh. And the word stuck in our culture, and now we throw it around. But it's about um, us being formed around our meaning, our being formed around something that isn't healthy to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so as, as someone in ministry, I need to work. I need with Holy Spirit's guidance and listening to know myself, to know, am I headed in a healthy manner? Is what I'm wanting healthy? Or has it been dictated by my church culture? Has it been dictated by my American culture? And where, where do I really belong? Which I think means we got a lot of heart searching to do. Oh, that is so good, Jane. That yeah. What books did you find there, Morris? Well, you know, I'm um, you. You know, we all ought to be reading on on the topics that you can just find the books. Yeah. But um, for Christian leaders, um, the leader's journey. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the leader's journey, accepting the call to personal and congregational transformation, and it's going to lean really heavily into Christ and his his model of how he did that. But it's going to get into family systems theory. It's going to help you understand how systems work to create this type mm -hmm. of environment that's dangerous for the leader. And uh, I, if you were to say, of all the books on leadership that you've read, if you can only recommend one, it's The Leader's Journey by uh, Harrington, Creech, and Taylor. Um, I noticed that, guys. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I just want to say Eugene Peterson has been so helpful, the, contempl the contemplative pastor and the unnecessary pastor by Eugene and, and Marva Dawn, and maybe we could let the books go out later on, Monty, in terms of some of the help, helpful reading so that people aren't trying to write it down too fast right now. Um, but I am always trying to read books that lead to where Jane has talked about is, am I trying to control things that are not mine to control? Good. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have another question in the chat. And before I go over to that, I wanted to say that was a pinging in my head. Uh, a more, more so teaching that you gave, oh, it was quite a while ago, one of our... Uh, ordination uh, licensing consecration modules and it was on do I, I see if I get the title right do I have to give up me in order to minister to you yep. a huge session on just self-differentiation um, that I remember we had built we, we had built that module I walked away from that module with your teaching profoundly impacted to really to look in and and to look at self-differentiation in my in my own life so that I was leading out of a more healthy place. My performance side could be released. Uh, the pleaser side could be released. It, it, that was, uh, I, I, I stole your stuff and I've used it ever since. But, <laughs> well, you know, and Monty, that came so heavily uh, out of this book. You know, okay. I, was, I was leaning heavily into that. Yeah, it was, um, um, you know, how, the title was how do i um 
um, pastor you without losing me or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Do I have to give up me in you order pastor to you. pastor you? Do yep. I have to give, give up me? Yeah, so that was good. Yep. And I honestly, that still is bearing fruit in my life and in my ministry to this day. Yeah. Um, here's the question. It says, given all the losses and hard stuff that has happened in this season, how do we lead our people uh, to not miss the God moments in this season, like engaging in justice, racism, conversations of our day, especially in predominantly white and conservative environments? Given all the losses, how do we lead our people to not miss the God moments in a season like this, like by engaging in justice and racism conversations, especially in predominantly white and conservative church environments? Good question. Gold I'll, question. I'll, I just lay it right on the line. White conservative churches don't want to change. <laughs> White conservative churches don't know how they how they still want to be um, want to white. And, and 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 even if they do think they want to change, if they were to actually get into a multiracial, multi-ethnic con context. They would find out how desperately they don't want to change because people don't want to worship the way they want to worship. They don't want to sing the songs they sing as white people. They don't want to lead their elder boards the same way white people lead their elder boards. They just don't want to do a whole lot of things that white people do. So we have not yet fully understood what it means to let go of white privilege. Now, you all are reading on this right now, and you've heard it a hundred different ways. And the great pain you're carrying is, how do I pastor a conservative white community, um, yeah. most of you? Who, uh, who, who aren't willing and ready to change. And yeah. I, I just want to say, um, you're gonna, first of all, I, I feel like a beginner in this area. Um, I only barely touched on it as a leader. Um, I'm now looking back and wishing that I had been way more aware and I'm sad by what I wish I could have done differently, but that's the way it is. Um, I, I just applaud you for what you just said and the question you just asked, because I know you're going to bleed to go there. And you're going to lose. You're going to lose people to go there. Um, there are people that, as soon as you mention any of those issues, they're going to push back on you. Yeah. So I, I just think that we're going to have to practice the solitude and the centering practices to stay very centered of what our calling is and what price we might be might be needing to pay to help our congregation to keep addressing the issues. This is yeah. where Jesus Jesus did not back down. And <laughs> at one point, he had asked his disciples, "Are you going to leave me too?" I don't think I've ever been willing to go that low in ministry. And, and this is the great struggle, Monty, that I was asking you about is, you know, if, if you put yourself at risk by calling people to the truth, um, that's your career. That's your financial stability for your family. Um, right. In many cases, it's just hard to think about, about putting some of that at risk by calling people to the truth about these issues. Um, but, but I just applaud people who are, are slowly but surely and just intentionally moving forward on that. Yeah. Uh, can, can I chime in here? Yeah. Uh, I, I would really agree with uh, Morris that what I hear a lot is that people just want to return to normal. Uh, can, can we just get back? And yet... As, as people look at what they've lost and they also look at what do, what am I seeing that I didn't see before? Wow. I think there's a little piece of light there that, that people see, oh, there's something going on here. There's something going on that I, I don't want to lose. And if we go back to doing it exactly the way we did before, I don't know if we'll be able to keep that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I will go back to my, my record that has the big chip out of the side of it and say the same thing, is that um, knowing myself, knowing what's going on inside, not how am I going to fix this this group of people but start with myself i remember back when morris morris took me he took me up to mount angel and if morris asks you to go to mount angel for the day you know some you're in trouble or something's up 
<laughs> so he invited me way, way many years ago to go up to Mount Angel for the day. And he said to me, when he was trying to talk me out of leaving my therapy practice and to join, to start the recovery program, he said, Jane, and this came from his heart. I know that another sermon from me will not stem the bleeding of our people. And that he told me about what was going on in him. He didn't give me some great truth that he had come across or this or that. He told me about what was going on inside. Mm -hmm. And we have, I believe we need to know ourselves. And as we know ourselves, I believe that is where humility comes from. <laughs> and that is not a very pleasant process. Yeah. Finding out that I was as broken as my alcoholic son. Oh, mm. broken in very different ways. Mm. Broken in very different ways, but so uh, I have, I've said many times, you know, I grew up in a strict fundamentalistic family. I knew, I knew I had so much information and I asked Jesus into my heart when I was a six year old. And I think I, I knew the story, but it really was kind of, it was really good of Jesus to include me because I was really a pretty good kid. You know, I wasn't bad like the bad people. <laughs> but as I, as in God's mercy, I was allowed to see myself and to see my heart. Oh, oh, I realized, oh, he really did die for me. Mm -hmm. I needed that. That was just, I, I, I don't know how to express what that was. But I think that in solitude and in center being centered in listening we begin to know ourselves and as we know ourselves we don't just ask jesus into our hearts we begin on the path of the way of the cross mm. and the way of the cross oh that doesn't sell real good. <laughs> that isn't, uh, that is, oh, that is self-denial. That is, oh, it, it is a very different, ah, for lack of a better word to put it, that is a very different Christianity <laughs> than, than what I had. And so I come back to, if nothing else today, look at the losses Look at yourself, what you're feeling, and allow God's spirit to show you your own brokenness, mm -hmm. your own what that is. And then as we share what's true for me, mm -hmm. I believe it's contagious. That's good. So good. Um, we're running. We're, we're coming towards the end. Uh, I had just maybe a, a couple more uh, questions I'd love to, to throw towards you. Um, one's on strategies. I've heard a few strategies um, thrown out today. Maybe we can, you know, re regroup some of those as far as, you know, solitude, um, working on becoming aware of, of our feelings, our emotions, what's going on under the waterline, uh, a lot of those things. But so here, one question would be, what, what have been some bad strategies you've been seeing that leaders have been employing to deal with the effects of COVID and just how tired and beat up we all are. So what are some bad strategies? And then maybe if we could close with, uh, what would you say, what's a good rule that could come out of this webinar that you would say, these, here's, here's a good rule of, of, a, of a few things to start doing that will move us towards resiliency a better ability to self-differentiate and to experience and find joy and find God even in the midst of this because he's he's at work. So what have been some of the bad strategies you've seen? And then give us some good ones. I, I just want to pick up on what Jane said. If, if I'm not 
I think a really dangerous strategy is to not look at what's making you anxious and why yeah. and getting underneath that, whether it's people, yeah. um, your loss of self-differentiation, um, fear of losing people from the congregation, fear of speaking the truth, of feeling rejected, of losing your security. Um, I don't know any other way to process that but to be alone with Jesus and to be alone or to be with a few other people who you can share your brokenness with. Um, if, we, if we don't own the brokenness we're experiencing as pastors, that's being revealed to us by our ministries, that's opening up the closet to our anxiety. If we're not going somewhere to God and to others with that properly, and we're, and we're missing the, the, the flashing light of, yeah. of leading in a healthy way. Um, and, you know, with regards to strategy and leading congregations, um, I think today, I, I think we don't know yet how to lead out of this yet, but the first place is to be really centered and have, yeah. have, have dealt with the dangerous issues that you as a leader might get pulled into um, where you're just going to lead from an unhealthy place going forward. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel like I'm capable of really saying what are the mistakes that I see. I just see that it is so easy, uh, always, but particularly this last year, to connect uh, our significance, our security, our identity in what we're doing as a church leader. Yeah. And... Um, and being able to back off and say, oh, if my identity, if my significance, if my security is built on anything that can change for any reason, <laughs> then the foundation under me is shaky. Yeah. Uh, it's what Jesus called sand, and uh, it doesn't work. Uh, when the storm hits, it's, it's going to go. And we've had this, we've got the storm and the storm, hey, it looks like maybe it's going to let up, but who knows? The last year, we just, we think something, then something else happens. So I just say back to what is my security? What, where do I find significance? Where, what is my identity? And I think it comes back to that as I, as I really know Jesus, I find that I am valuable. And because I am valuable, not because of the ministry I have, or the people I see, or the church I lead, but I am valuable to the creator of the universe. And therefore, I get to do some things for however many years he has me, I get to do that. And it goes to him. It's not about that what I do makes me valuable or any of that. I am valuable. And as I spend that quiet time, as I learn to listen, I hear that and I get to know. I don't know about him. I get to know him. And that changes my life and it changes my ministry. So good. So how about a how about a a rule for the day? What are your top three, maybe? Top three, top four. I heard solitude, getting alone, becoming aware. Any other practices from uh, the spiritual direction side that you would really encourage in this season, Morris and Jane? I I think having somebody besides myself to talk to. Okay. Find that, uh, I think find that soul friend. Yeah. yeah, a soul friend. And not just some, I, I think um, um, I had a good friend uh, who used to say to me, Jane, you're, you've got to know somebody that is, who absolutely knows you don't walk on water. Yeah. <laughs> it was some of the best advice I ever had. Yeah. And uh, because I can, if left to my own devices, I forget yeah. <laughs> of what, uh, of my frailties. Good. 
Yeah, on the, you know, solitude has always been so high on my list because it's the time when you can actually reflect and read and ponder and pray and, and process with God. So, um, and I think that, I think that we've all been overcome with busyness. So um, yes. this is just a real deep concern I have for learning how to practice solitude. Uh, but like right alongside of Jane, I just want to say, I, I remember going to a spiritual director at my point of deepest emotional crisis and my brokenness. And uh, she asked me a question and it was, I will never forget this. It was, um, have you noticed how often you're saying, I'm trying to figure this out. Why did this happen? Why did I cave in in ministry? Why did I lose my way? And it was all about trying to gain control of what had happened to me. I wanted to be able to manage that to make sure it would never happen again. So a spiritual director, a soul friend, group spiritual direction, however you come at it in a triad or a small group, places where people will ask you based on what you've shared, the deeper uh, questions that lead you to awareness and awakening um, is, would be critical for me. And um, like those two, I don't think we can pray well or lead well or do much anything well until we are in a contemplative posture, a reflective posture. I'm just praying out of, I'm just praying out of my compulsivity. So I know people put prayer at the top of the list, but, but I think Jesus probably practiced solitude first to mm -hmm. set the stage so that he could pray what he needed to pray because yeah. he was in tune with his inner life before he started to pray. He was in tune with what was happening. And so I think being alone helps you to get in tune with that and being in, in direction or with a soul friend or with the right kind of community where you're talking about these things helps yes. you to do that. Support and recovery helps you to do that. A counselor helps you to do that. And so, where you're getting some honest feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks to both of you for, uh, being on the the webinar today i really appreciate it um and to all of uh, our alliance northwest friends who have been on today i love you and appreciate you guys digging in and engaging in this conversation too maybe a you know a closing thought from me to you would be in the midst of covid uh, i would i would give you a sermon i preached many times over the last 34 years is when you're in the midst of the storm or a crisis it's not the time to make major shifts and changes. You all have to pivot to do church, but the, it's not the time. It's, it's really hard to get clarity from the Lord in the middle of the storm. That's the time to, to lean in and listen to the Lord. So be careful that you're not just jumping into performance mode and trying to fix things to control your future. This is the time to remember that Jesus builds the church. Yes. COVID's also given us a time to... to address our scorecards coming out of COVID. How do, who do we want to be? How do we want to lead? And so, you know, maybe the scorecard uh, could change from faithfulness in leading uh, to change to, to that from success in ministry. Um, th those will help you, I, I would think, get to the rule that Jane and Morris are laying out to have the centered presence and peace of Christ. If you're lead, I believe if you're leading from that center, um, one success is whatever God does versus what your competing churches do. And, uh, you'll, I think you'll, you'll find the rhythms that are most helpful for your health in there. So, you know, we love you guys. Any last words from Morris and Jane, any, any, any last words you want to say before we, uh, we sign off today? I just want to say a lot of my partners that have helped me, we talk about being honest, our yeah. books are books by, by people who have opened my mind up to their journey in ministry. And so my library is full of the books of, of people who have mentored me. And, and so you may not be a reader, but you need to be reading. If we're not reading, you're not growing. And so for me, for me, formational reading, spiritual reading is very high on the list of my of my ability to develop good and i would say the same thing that uh, i feel like i have mentors lined up on my bookshelves and they have when eugene peterson died i thought oh you can't leave i need another book from you yeah. and um the his book christ plays in ten thousand yeah. places 
I have read the book. I, the only way I could read the last chapter was to say to me, I'm going to start right over and read it right again. Mm -hmm. And as I read it and the truth that Christ is in everything, he is doing things every place, helps me sit down and go, oh, the world doesn't depend on me. This is Christ playing in 10,000 places with faces not his own. Oh, it's so exciting to get to be a part of that. Yeah, awesome. Um, well, thank you both. And again, thanks to everyone who logged on today. And I look forward to uh, seeing all of you uh, on the next webinar. So have a great week. And uh, hopefully we'll be connecting soon. Thanks, Morris. Thank thanks, you, Bonnie. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.